We're doing it for ourselves. Just do good for your own self. When you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because of deceitfulness, lust excited by deceit, and deceitful influences seducing to sin. Deceitful lusts by a paragram are being applied to the agape love feasts, the communal celebration in the church in which food, fellowship, and worship is shared in an assembly. Base men have transformed this church celebration into seductive revels through things pleasing to the eye with the power to attract, bewitch, and captivate under a magic spell. Music, the lights, the crowds. It looks like a rock concert. And the lines around the block are enough to make any nightclub envious. But this, this is church. They are testing, tempting, and provoking many by arousing sexual desires and influencing others to do things that are unwise and morally wrong. This is done to cheat and beguile. They are distracting people's attention by amusing and charming them to divert them from the truth that they may be deceived. How far have we fallen? As a church, you know, I'm a fan, I've been a fan, longtime fan of Hillsong's music, but this Hillsong church is clearly under the direction of the New World Order. The term New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. 
So they call it new spirituality, but in the church we find it in many different forms. The emerging movement, the positive confession movement, the word faith movement, the contemplative movement, the uh, new apostolic reformation. So basically it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. We have a very clever adversary who knows how to redefine and reinvent the Christian faith. And that's what we're watching happen right before our very eyes. In the world religions, there's always been this, uh, this fascination with the mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. Now, we have that all the way back within Christianity through the Gnostics and then through the, the Desert Fathers and, and the Middle Ages and, and uh, a lot of the mysticism that came through Catholicism. But those things were kind of more out on the margins. Uh, they were only in, in particular groups of people within denominations. What we're finding now is that that is hitting the mainstream of Christianity. Barbara Marks Hubbard, probably the almost the, the matriarch of today's contemporary New Age movement, has a book called Emergence, The Shift from Ego to Essence, Ten Steps to the Universal Human. David Spangler, father of the New Age, called the shaman of the New Age, has a book called Emergence, The Rebirth of the Sacred, The God Within. The book As Above, So Below, written by the editors of New Age magazine, talk about the emergent spirituality. And they talk all about contemplative prayer and esoteric Christianity. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. He discovered that these practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. Thomas Keating popularized the movement called centering where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And actually, Thomas Keating has acknowledged that that practice of contemplative meditation, even in its Christianized version, is identical to the Eastern meditation and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the kundalini demonic force, to rise up even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. One thing that, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. We are being told, not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but by many who are now in leadership, that we need to have spiritual experiences for an authentic faith. As far as Christianity is concerned, the corruption is coming into the church from outside. We're embracing those things that God speaks nothing of in Scripture unless He's speaking against it. And a lot of Christian leaders are really devaluing the Bible. And that's really very common in the, in the merging, emerging New Spirituality church. The Bible is really reliable, and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups, Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses who's helped develop many programs, he was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church. It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community, and by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up, not surprisingly, 
by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, talking about God's dream. Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream. And both the New Age and the church, Erwin McManus used the term, uses the term God's dream. It's a metaphor for the coming world peace. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government, which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion. And it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one world government, a one world religion, which would bring a utopia on earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like. The idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became in the 1940s and 50s the Latter Rain Movement. An offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God and part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham. One of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God, we were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Unless you are looking to the word of God, you have no way of testing what these prophets who are coming, predicting and prophesying in the name of God are saying to you. Sadly, we do know that, uh, that the world itself will turn its back on Israel in the latter days. Uh, we see the, the, um, the nuts and bolts being put together right now. The nations that are arraying themselves against Israel, they're all in place right now as we speak. Anybody who takes the Bible seriously and what it teaches will always see Israel as the apple of God's eye and do everything to their last drop of blood to defend them. Jerusalem, it's the seat of worship and it'll be the place where uh, when God restores all things to their, their former self, the church needs to be aware of how we treat Israel and how we should be praying for them. If you do not know solid doctrine, if you do not know the signs of the end of the age, if you do not know what the original in scripture looks like, how will you test when the counterfeits come, claiming to be from the word of the living God? The Bible should act as our anchor or as our mooring uh, so that we're just not carried around wherever the, the tide wants to take us. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. Traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Um, the message of much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. The devil doesn't want people to be focused on what's to come. He wants us to be very much engaged with the things going on down here on earth. If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, 
it's going to change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth until we fix everything down here and that everybody's going to eventually get to heaven anyway, you can go ahead and take a very, very uh, uncommitted view of your Christianity. You can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. Our young people are not going to be reached through emergent gimmicks and techniques, through candles or labyrinths, through pizza parties, through chanting parties, through meditation techniques and yoga seminars. These young people aren't going to be reached because you are conforming the gospel to their culture, but because you are bringing the gospel to them in their culture and saying to them, the Lord is relevant for you today. For his gospel, his word of salvation, is what will bring you into that relationship with God without the use of gimmicks or occult techniques. What makes a Christian? Not the church that you go to. It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? We embrace the lie because the father of lies masquerades as an angel of light. He uses pieces of the truth to shape the lie, so the lie appears to be the truth. How can we recognize the difference between the truth and the lie? The enemy ingeniously crafts the lie to appear as light. Charity, benevolence, enlightenment, purpose, mind, body, spirit, coexist, world peace, tolerance, justice, politically correct, heavenly, angelic, but denies the true light of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Is God behind the world peace movement? Would Jesus preach the coexist gospel? Is the Holy Spirit part of the mind-body-spirit craze? See to it that the light within you is not darkness. One aspect of appealing to the postmodern generation is to introduce techniques, spirituality, litanies, rituals, and so on. This is called vintage Christianity or ancient future Christianity. Let's go back to the disciplines of the monks. Let's introduce some of the ideas of the East from yoga. Yoga, 2,000-year-old pagan religious philosophy, which is now widespread throughout the emergent church movement. Never see Jesus talking about walking prayer labyrinths, teaching his disciples to practice yoga, practice contemplative prayer. These are all things that don't come from biblical Christianity at all, but are being embraced by the emergent church today because they're looking for some kind of subjective, personal encounter with the divine. And so they say that if we can find these kinds of things in other religions, let's borrow these things from other religions and just call them Christian. For those uh, who profess to be a part of the evangelical church, they're now introducing prayer altars, prayer labyrinths, uh, techniques, bells, incense, candles, all of these things that have a very sensual seduction, but they are not biblical. Many people who are seeking after an experience to participate in Christianity are not interested in studying the Word of God. They say that you know teaching the Bible word by word or verse by verse, that just doesn't work today. What you need is the experiences that you need to be able to smell God, taste God, feel God, touch God. Years ago, Psychology Today said that the Eastern worldview, Eastern religions would come to the West as a psychology. Psychology is not science, it is experiential. It has to do with feelings and moods and understanding. It also teaches uh, bottom line that we are innately good. This is an idea out of Hinduism. Christ in New Age terms is a state of being rather than a person. It means someone who is in touch with their higher self or their true self. They see Jesus as someone who came to show us our divinity. But this was God in the occultic sense. This was not the Judeo-Christian God. This was a God that resonated with the Hindu and Buddhist concepts of God, a God that you could have mystical experiences with, a God that you could embrace through uh, meditative practices. 
New Age spirituality, the concept of the divine and all is now considered to be quite normal, whereas before it was considered to be blasphemous. Contemplative prayer, also known as centering prayer, is where we can come to the fuller understanding of the unity of all that is. Well, these are classic Hindu concepts, you know, all is one, unity of all that is. In other words, there's no such thing as good or evil or the kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan, that all is one, everything is united. The practice of contemplative prayer is a mystical tradition, which goes back centuries and can be traced back to a group called the Desert Fathers. It's presented as the way to know God at a deeper level. Centering prayer was where one goes into the silence, one takes a Christian word and says it over and over again, and you go into altered states of consciousness and you actually come out with the same mindset as people who are doing yoga. These ideas take people away from the Word of God towards mystical experiences, and these experiences are exactly the kinds of things that are practiced in the East by those who promote Eastern mysticism. Contemplative spirituality is a belief that I can look within. It's a very subjective and experiential technique for finding truth, but not based on the Word of God based on somebody's feelings and experience. And what we have to understand is that in a mystical way of approaching God, it's all subjective. It's all what, what you hear in your altered states of consciousness. Christians have to base our faith on what the Bible says. Christians have to have faith in the Word. Non-Christians have to hear the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. One of the major ideas of the purpose-driven movement is that the world can be transformed by working together for the cause of good, to bring a social change on planet Earth, to eradicate AIDS, poverty, illiteracy, and other major problems that the world faces. Rick Warren in the purpose-driven movement is going to reform the church. So he says his idea is that we're going to change what the church does using modern marketing techniques and business management techniques, Rick Warren has a program called the Peace Plan. Rather than going forth and preaching the gospel authoritatively, calling people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins, and to uh, serve Him. Jesus clearly told us that the end was coming and that as the end drew near, we would see more and more chaos, confusion, catastrophe in our world. And this is why, as Christians, we need to keep the gospel at the forefront, which is the eternal heart condition of men and women. The peace plan is we're going to go out and solve the world's problems, cooperating with the other world religions. Rick Warren, he even says that the man of peace who could help you in a village can be a a Muslim. Can you work with Muslims? Can you work with Hindus and bring this all together as one global faith? Biblical Christians believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He came once, paid the penalty for our sins. He's coming again. We look for his return. Other religions have messianic ideas. They believe that someone is going to come and solve the problems of the world. For example, in Islam, the twelfth imam who's going to come and deal with all the kinds of issues that, that are problematic today. Within Hinduism, they're looking for an avatar, looking for another incarnation. In Tibetan Buddhism, another Dalai Lama. The problem is, is that these are false messiahs, and the only one who's going to fit their definition, their view, is the Antichrist. The emergent church really believe that we can eliminate poverty, we can save the environment, we can uh, end racism and genocide and all the social ills in the world. And that is the gospel for the emergent church. This is an ecumenical idea. Ecumenism meaning that, um, uh, that all religions have a part to play in solving the problems that we see around the world. The Roman Catholic Church is really the catalyst for the ecumenical movement today. It's building bridges into all Christian denominations, and that's what ecumenism is. It's an attempt to unite all of Christianity. There's been a great influence by the Roman Catholic religion. Their eschatology says that Jesus Christ will not return until the whole world is Roman Catholic. And so they have an ambition to unite all of Christianity under the power and influence of the Pope. Prophecy tells us that there will be an apostate form of Christianity. 
and we see that there's two streams of Christianity operating side by side for the last 2,000 years. You have the apostolic church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ that follows the teachings of the apostles, and then you have the apostate church operating right along with it, and those are following doctrines of demons. It's a false brand of Christianity. There is a new gospel being promoted today by the emergent church. There are many church leaders who say we need to reinvent Christianity. These popular movements are creating alternatives to biblical Christianity. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few are those who are on that path. But wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those that travel that path. the so-called church who have made an idol they have created a god who doesn't exist doesn't exist doesn't exist there are millions of ways to be a human being and, and many ways no but many paths to what you call god that and her path crazy. might be something else and when she gets there she might call it the light but her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. Yeah, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? There is one way and only one way, and there that is through Jesus. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because the you of people say there is. There couldn't possibly be. Then when someone comes later and tries to preach the gospel to them because they're living in the world, they won't listen. Because a religious lie has so much power. I feel like if I can be pure and feel good before God that I, I don't have to... You know, I always want to listen to people and receive good criticism, but I just feel like I don't have to answer them. I have to answer to God. And so I just try to stay focused on what God's called me to do. Because the God they've been worshiping is not the God of the Bible. It's a figment of their own imagination, a God they made with their mind, and then they worship what they made. And he looks more like Santa Claus than he does Yahweh. Now, let me tell you something about false teachers. You think so many times that people fall prey to false teachers. And that, in a sense, can be true at times. But I think the dominant theme in Scripture is just the opposite. False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. Just do good for your own self. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Those people who sit under Him are not victims of Him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what He wants and it's not God. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. Just do good for your own self. We have these large churches filled with many unconverted carnal people. But in those churches, we also have this small group of people that honestly want Christ and they honestly want His Word and they honestly want to be transformed. They don't need anything else. All they need is true worship of the true God and Scripture being preached to them and lived out before them. That's what they want. Now, I want to tell you the great sin of the American pastor. And this has got me in a lot of trouble, but it's true. This small group of converted people in that local church all they want is Jesus and all they want to do is the right thing they want purity they want truth they want Christ but the pastor in order to keep this larger group of unconverted people he caters to them so while he is feeding these carnal men and women with carnal things, he is letting the sheep of God starve to death, and he is going to stand before God one day in judgment. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Have you ever heard the term ecstasis worship? No? <laughs> well, many people haven't. It's a powerful word. It's a Greek word that means, well, you'll find out in a, in a little while because I want to introduce to you Caleb Brundage. He's one of our itinerant ministries, but also just a worshiper with so much passion. In fact, if you've been to any of our conferences, you'll see Caleb flagging and worshiping God and opening up the heavens and operating in a real breaker level anointing. He actually is a DJ as well and leads a lot of Christian events and weddings and, and uh, you know just high school events and things like that. So if you would ever like to know more about him, he's on our itinerant page on our website. But today he's going to tell you about Club Mysterio and about the ecstasis worship that takes place during those times of, of uh, gathering together. So it's my privilege to introduce to you Caleb Brendage. This generation is hungry, hungry for the mysteries of God. This generation longs to experience God in a way, in an abandoned way. Like never before. They long to release their passion for God. When we're making decrees and we're praising God, the music and you're jumping and you're, you're, you're dancing and you're moving around, well, the words that we're speaking becomes one at a cellular level in your body and it's not like you're learning it, it's part of who you are. It's no longer that you have to study the word, it's no longer that you have to study the word, it's no longer that you have to study the word. When you're inside of an infused atmosphere with dancing and your body is moving and the word is coming and the music, it becomes part of you. And it's just like, oh man, with the, with the rhythm, the sound, and the repetitiveness of the music, the word is driven into your body. Not just your mind, not just your soul, but the whole mind, body, and soul. Ecstasious worship is worship that when you go outside of your mind, when you go outside of your mind, when you go outside of your mind, yourself into abandoned worship with God, going into the ecstasy of God. Club Mysterio is a place where you can come and experience ecstasious worship. What is happening around the world in many places now is so very much the spirit of a serpent, so very clearly the work of the enemy. I believe that Kenneth Hagin has been operating in the spirit of a sorcerer since 1938. That's 59 years. I believe he's been building and bewitching the people all during these 59 years. This was the Kenneth Hagin Holy Ghost meeting. In that meeting, it is very clear to me that the spirit of the serpent 
was manifest. The primary things that I saw was the hissing, like the hissing of a serpent. And of course, to go with that was the tongue of this man, Kenneth Hagin, coming out and slithering like the tongue of a serpent. Let's see what we can do here. Okay. <laughs> Satan himself is laughing at these foolish people. And such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Here is a metaphysical, paranormal power by which they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers also be transformed metaphysically, paranormal, as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. That every human being was a God. God came from heaven became a man, made man into little God. You say, Benny, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. Because you are divine. But the most stupid book. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in His image? I'm a God man. I'm a sample of Jesus. I'm a God man. We are Christ. We are Christ. <laughs> We are Christ. We are Christ. We are Christ.
man. It's one thing to have, you know, God gather the people together. Yeah. It's another thing to have the same spirit, the Benjamin generation, yeah. having the same mother. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. And the same Mother Grace. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. This is a longtime friend and partner of this ministry, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I know my grandparents were in your country in yes, 2005, 2005, I think, and I, you were a strong support to them in that meeting, and I know they've never forgotten. I enjoyed having them. And of course, they love you, and they love your ministry. And uh, somebody I want to introduce to you, Brother Tony, come on up, would you please? He's going to be telling you the story. I asked him to come give his testimony, and he's got a special message for us tonight. Hostel Church. Like I said, I came to radical faith, both me and Emiliana, my wife, we had radical conversion experiences. We've been raised in the Word of Faith. But uh, I've been the Word of Faith, so to speak, we call it the Word of Faith, you know, um, for for many years now. We've been raised in the Word of Faith. We call it the Word of Faith, you know, um, for for many years now. We've been raised in the Word of Faith. Pope was Mario Jorge Bergoglio. My friend, my spiritual father had become the Pope. So tonight, the Pope, it's a historic moment because I've never, I've served three Popes. Because I've never, I've served three Popes. Because I've never, I've served three popes. Because I started working with them when John Paul was still alive, and then Pope Benedict, and now Pope Francis. And you know, Pope Francis, Saint Francis of Assisi was an open charismatic. This is the first pope in history that took the Francis's name. Because he's openly charismatic. Because he's openly charismatic. How misunderstood he is especially among us in the charismatic uh, uh, circle. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs.
Dear brothers and sisters, and it's one thing to have, you know, God gather the people together. Yeah. It's another thing to have the same spirit, the Benjamin generation, yeah. having the same mother, yeah. having the same mother, yeah. having the same mother. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace and the same Mother Grace and the same Mother Grace. It's gaining momentum. There's a whole generation that has experienced the gospel revolution. They are a grace generation and a whole, a whole new sound, the sound of grace, the sound of grace. It's a grace generation. It's a generation that has a mother who is called grace. The gen generation that has a mother who is called grace. The ancient religion of Babylon, they all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine. Ishtar of the Babylonians, Tyre of the Buddhism, Fatima of Muhammad, Sophia of the Gnostics, Shekinah to the Kabbalist Jew, Mary to the Catholic, and Shakti to the Hindu. These all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine. And the sacred feminine is going to take you back to the source of light because the light that resides in that place that Plato talked about, you need a path to get back to that light. Listen, this is important. She is the one to take you to that light. Now, I'm going I'm to give you a guess. Tell me this morning, who do you think that light is? You remember what this subject's all about? Lucifer. He's the light bearer. Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis herrenus iluxit. Et te convivit et reniat in secula seculorum. Ti benedico, che fratello a fratello.
Jesus said these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. My friends, my spiritual father, my spiritual father had become the Pope. Un abraccio. Grazie. I want you to video a message back. Come up here and let's do it this way so he can see this, this whole congregation. My dear sir, thank you so from the bottom of our hearts. All of these leaders represent literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for all you around and me with are you, familiar and we do faces, so with all of our hearts. Our we bless faces, you with all of our souls. We bless faces, you with all of our minds. Bright and we thank you for the daily races. We thank you. Going nowhere. And so, going nowhere. And the tears are filling up. Yes, I mean, I thank God for, for you know, teachers like Brother Copeland, you know, Brother Hagen, and Brother E.W. Canyon, you know, they, they taught And I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad, the dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take, when people run in circles, it's a very, very... I find it hard to tell you, 
I find it hard to take 